Hi, I'm Amanda. Hey, it's Justine. Hi, it's LJ. And Meg here. This is not a normal episode of Pod Appetite. As many of you will know, this has been an unprecedented week in the world of BA, and it's now impossible to carry on as we were. But we feel a duty to our listeners to say something, to try and make sense of what we've been confronted with as fans this week, figure out what we think this means for BA and the fan community, and what that means for everyone going forward. We're recording this on Sunday, June 14th, um, and this is our attempt to tell the story so far. So we're going to give a pretty detailed blow-by-blow of major events that happened in the Bon Appetit world, starting with last weekend. In response to Bon Appetit's food is political statement in the wake of the Black Lives Matter protests the past few weeks, a Puerto Rican food columnist, Ileana Masonette, started tweeting screenshots of DN conversations she'd had where editor-in-chief Adam Rappaport was explaining why her pitch for an article showcasing Puerto Rican food hadn't succeeded. In it, he had said that it wasn't accessible enough, and she called him out on his choice of words, saying, accessible equals what's comfortable. Then on Monday, we've got quite a few updates. Um, In response to Ileana's tweets, a writer, Tammy Teclamarium, tweeted a picture from Adam's wife's Instagram. The Instagram was posted in 2013, and it was a picture of them in brown face from 2004, a Halloween costume. They had dressed up um, as a Puerto Rican couple for the Halloween. In Tammy's tweet, it said, I don't know why he doesn't just simply write about Puerto Rican food for B.A. himself. One of the comments on the Instagram post was from Jane Larkworthy, beauty editor of The Cut, saying, this was so dead on. I was so afraid of you two that night. Very quickly, several B.A. staffers started commenting in response to the post. Priya tweeted, As a BA contributor, I can't stay silent on this. This is fucked up, plain and simple. It erases the work the Black Indigenous people of color on staff have long been doing behind the scenes. I plan to do everything in my power to hold the editor-in-chief and systems that hold up actions like this accountable. Then Christina tweeted her disgust having not tweeted since before Trump was elected. Carla made a statement on Twitter saying she had accepted the brand's definition of mainstream and not done enough to support Black Indigenous people of color, focusing instead on trying to dismantle the quote-unquote bro culture at BA. Then, most notably, Sola made a statement in her Instagram stories that sent further shockwaves into the fan community, because this was bigger than just Adam. She stated, I am angry and disgusted by the photo of Rappaport in brown face. I have asked for his resignation. This is just a symptom of the systemic racism that runs rampant within Condé Nast as a whole. I've been at Bon Appetit 10 months. I am 35 years old and have over 15 years of professional experience. I was hired as an assistant editor at 50,000 to assist mostly white editors with significantly less experience than me. I've been pushed in front of video as a display of diversity. In reality, currently only white editors are paid for their video appearances. None of the people of color have been compensated. I demand not only the resignation of Rappaport, but also to see black indigenous people of color given fair titles, salaries, and compensation for video appearances. And then we heard from Hawa Hassan, who had done three videos for Bon Appetit. She posted some explosive stories on her Insta stories, stating that she filmed those videos in October last year. She was paid $400 per video, and she demanded to be removed from the staff lineup photo um, in their promo photos that promote a facade of diversity when it was becoming clear that in reality, it's anything but. She also shared how she had pitched B.A. a whole series on her Somali food, spelling out the opportunities it would bring for them, and they weakened it down to just a few token videos. It's fair to say the internet was horrified, us included. These people that we have grown to love and embrace as our corner of the internet were not being looked after fairly and being exploited to feed our demand. Many fans have expressed guilt and are upset that we have had a part in feeding the monster. And we wanted to know who was responsible. Insight as to how compensation works for video at BA Emerge. Staffers from BA are contracted primarily through Condé Nast. But if they are offered a series on video, they are offered additional contracts on top of this through Condé Nast Entertainment, which can be very lucrative. 
Only white chefs have been offered these contracts in video series. Everyone else who appears in video is unpaid. As the day progressed, more staffers and ex-staffer made statements on Twitter and Instagram. BA writer Jesse Sparks, research director Joseph Hernandez, photographer Alex Lau, and everyone's favorite video editor, Matt Hunziker, Hunzi as we call him, all shared impassioned frustration at the culture at BA and that they had been telling leadership about it for months. More day-to-day examples of the microaggressions and party line of keeping the white status quo emerged. Hunzi shared he was in a meeting once where they were told that the brand wanted to increase diversity, but preserve, quote unquote, the voice. Towards the end of the day, Vincent Cross, aka Vinny, Brad's former beloved video guy who left last year, tweeted simply, Oh, you guys just thought I didn't enjoy making It's Alive, Gourmet Makes, Alex Eats It All 24-hour videos? We started to see statements appear on some of the bigger stars' Instagrams such as Molly and Delaney about standing with their black indigenous people of color colleagues, but they all seemed vague and as though they'd all had a meeting about what to post until later that day, Molly stepped up. She made a stand by declaring she would not appear in any more videos on BA until her black indigenous people of color colleagues get equal pay and are fairly compensated. She tagged all her other white co-stars asking that they join her. Over the following hours and days, Carla, Delaney, Andy, Emil, Brad, Rick, Chris, and Claire stated they would join her, and even Hunzi said he refused to edit anything until change happens. By the end of the day, it was announced that Adam was stepping down to reflect on the work that he needs to do as a human being. But from all the accounts and stories that have been shared throughout the day, it was clear more was needed, and people had noticed that Matt Ducker, Condé Nast's head of video, had been suspiciously silent on the entire thing. By the end of the day, on Monday, Matt Ducker eventually stated that the way we determine who should and shouldn't be incrementally compensated for video beyond their salaries is flawed and it needs to change. The general fan community reaction was that this was vague and a weak statement from someone with the power to actually affect that change. People started calling for his resignation too, including Hawa. Ooh, what a day. Monday was was intense. Sola's Instagram story heard round the world. Yeah. Yeah. It was um obviously, you know, the the photo was like the smoking gun, like the touch paper that, that lit the the story but solas was like boom this is huge Mm -hmm. like it's more than just one guy it's an entire systemic issue um and it's affecting pay it's affecting you know fairness in what they're doing at work and it was like oh boy there's a whole thing here it's interesting that molly is the first to step up because she was referenced in those original dms as the BA editor who covered the Puerto Rican uh, food markets that mm-hmm. they were discussing. Did she know the background yeah. of who had largely covered that to begin with? The white staffers are just feigning ignorance across the board. Well, yeah, we'll see that. Um, I think a lot of them have realized the extent of their, you know, blindness to this, whether it's willful or unconscious. Um, and To Molly's credit, she's been the one to step up first and do more than just vague kind of, oh, I'm sorry, I need to do better. Like she actually, you know, declared that she's not not participating in anything and and called, she tagged in everyone else to join her. Yeah. Um, Which is, you know, if you truly are going to be a white ally, it's that shit, it's that stuff that you need to do. Um, Mm -hmm. So I was pleased to see Molly do that on Monday. And Mm -hmm. also in instances like this, we as white people, we're all for white women here. We want to be looking to the people most affected to hear what they have to say. And interestingly, Sola has definitely been supporting what Molly has been saying. Kind of subtly, you'll see that Sola is liking all of Molly's Instagram posts and that type of thing, whereas she may not be liking other chefs' responses. Mm. And Sola also specifically called out in a good way Molly (laughs) in the Sporkful podcast, saying that she at least has acknowledged some of her complicity and complacency. Mm -hmm. 
I do want to break it down for those who may not understand, uh, especially on Monday. I feel like people were confused about how uh, pay works and how different um, job titles work at BA. And I think it's something that we've talked about a little bit on the podcast without even really knowing the nitty gritty. Mm. We have BA, the magazine, and we have our food editors there. We have the editors, like the senior editors. Chris is a deputy food editor. And then we have associate food editors, contributing food editors, and assistant food editors. And then Christina, who isn't even on the food editing side. She's in the magazine side as an editorial assistant. Okay. But anyway, regardless of that, is that... That that's something we didn't know about the whole pay structure. The people who have their own series are getting paid by Condé Nast Entertainment. As extra on top. So we would assume yes. from that knowledge that that means Molly, Chris, Andy, Emil, and Delaney, Carla. who all have series. Carla's contributing now, though. Oh, of course. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. But but she was not always contributing. So right. I am sure, as you said, that during the time when she was salaried, mm-hmm, that she yeah. was also receiving additional pay through contracts with Conway right. Nast Entertainment. Yes, yeah. good point. So someone like Chris, as a recent example, is making his salary, is making a contract of a series like reverse engineering, and is making money from brand deals. Remember, mm-hmm. he had that mm-hmm. video recently with the wine integration. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So those are three income sources to him, whereas... In that same video, Christina joined him and was only getting paid her base BA salary and nothing for the video. Yeah. Christina also pointed out something interesting that a lot of viewers may not realize is that Condé Nast has a talent manager. And it is this Mm -hmm. talent manager who sets up the, quote, talent with sponsorship opportunities like what we see on their Instagram, high visibility, Mm -hmm. product placement and branded content. And... Christina pointed out that none of the people of color were given an opportunity to have this talent manager work for them. Yeah, there's a lot of gatekeeping going on. It became very clear. Yeah. I do also want to maybe note that Andy is of Iranian descent. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. he perhaps cannot be lumped in with the rest of the white staffers. So that is maybe important to note as well. But there is some generalizing in some of our recap here. Yeah. I also wanted to note there other people that are considered like contributing would be Brad and Claire since, Mm -hmm. but they did used to be, you know, full-time BA employees. And then they had series on top of that. And clearly I think on Instagram, you can really tell that Brad has all sorts of branded content. So Mm. Like, they have also benefited yeah. from the system that was going on. Yeah, they took sure. the lucrative way out by quitting the magazine. <laughs> they make way more money doing mm-hmm. video. Yeah. yeah. But the rumors have it that Claire makes 20000 per video. Damn. Yeah, that's not confirmed. But yeah, that's definitely the rumor. <laughs> yeah. Which, I mean, more power to her. But at the same time, it's become abundantly clear that those opportunities were not offered to any of the people of color at the magazine. Right. So moving on to Tuesday, June 9th, mainstream media started picking up on the story. BuzzFeed posted a story where Sola told them that she was surprised by the support from the fans because BA has made her feel like no one cares about her, which is insane when there's such good feedback Hashtag solidarity started being picked up amongst fans as more and more people started to hear the news. Condé Nast released a vague and wishy-washy statement that no one had any time for. Then later in the day, more news started emerging regarding Alex Delaney. Some outraged fans had started going deep into the digital footprint of the BA staff, and in Delaney's case... What surfaced was an image from his Tumblr when he was 17 of a Confederate flag cake, as well as a decade-old vine of him using a gay slur. Alex immediately shared an apology on his Insta and said that those images do not reflect his values now and that he would be donating his entire next paycheck to the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. 
Not only that, but more dirt was dug up, this time on Matt Ducker. Old tweets that showed him making fun of people of color and homosexuality. Ducker tweeted that he was ashamed and he apologized. Calls got stronger for him to resign. Subscriber counts started to fall on the BA YouTube channel from 6.02 million Monday night to 6 million Tuesday morning. Um, it's also, there were, there were some people on the Instagram digging up a lot about um, Delaney. Yeah. yeah. Um, one thing not mentioned here is his Tumblr uh, blog being used on his resume yeah oh i had missed that part too because tuesday i know i was at work and checking in with you guys like on my lunch break and stuff and just like oh god oh god <laughs> this just keeps getting worse there was a lot of does delaney deserve this job and also this is a clear-cut case of how white privilege moves you up to becoming right. a right. senior drinks editor which isn't a real job title <laughs> <laughs> yeah um it was interesting we had an internal discussion about Delaney and like whether what he did and how uh, was it different any different to the outrage that um was kind of circled around uh Rappaport when his photo surfaced and it's interesting I feel like and maybe this is me being too generous. Um, I'm more than happy to be called out for it. But I feel like with Rappaport, his photo um, was when he was very definitely an adult. Um, and he it was also clear from his behavior, certainly it emerged more and more as the week went on, that his behavior and his attitude towards people of color hadn't changed because of his actions and the way that he behaved in the years since that photo was taken. Whereas with Delaney that confederate flag photo was taken when he was 17 we're all idiots when we're 17 i know i definitely was um and i think in his behavior and in his words and the sort of he's been very vocal politically on his social channels i think it's to me it's clear that he doesn't he doesn't think that's a funny thing to tweet anymore he doesn't think that's you know something to be proud of um right. And it feels like in my eyes, he has grown and learned as a human since then. But maybe, as I say, I'm more than happy to, I'm, I totally mm -hmm. don't begrudge people who don't share that opinion. They might think that, you know, how do we know that? Right, right. But definitely the staff at BA, like Andy, like Rick, have mm -hmm. pointed out mm -hmm. that the gay slurs are, are not to be tolerated and no. they are not looking to trust at this point. I uh, yeah, and that's totally. I I agree. Mm -hmm. I think that's reprehensible. I think we'll see it as we go through our timeline. There's more that Rick certainly was very vocal about uh, later in the week. Uh, one key thing with those, I, I think, also, I know we'll we'll come up to it more of the um, Business Insider article came out. One of the things said about the picture of Adam is it wasn't just on his wife's Instagram. He had that photo framed right. and on his desk currently. Yeah. And I feel like that definitely shows that it's not like, Oh, this was a thing that I did back in 2004 and it was a mistake. It's like, you're still proud of this. You still think it's funny. Yeah. yeah. I, that's and disgusting. I know internally we talked about, you know, how we're all stupid at 17. And I shared with you guys that like when I was 17, I was convinced that I was a conservative Republican because that's what my family was. And then, you know, went to college and thought for myself and grew up and made decisions on my mm -hmm. own. So I, I think, and as we, we talk more as this episode goes on, that there is room for people to grow and to change, but you also have to actually see that growth and change and it has to yeah. be supported by people of color not just other white people going like well good job right. you did something no it's not mm. for us to like decide whether he's he's grown and changed I enough totally agree yeah with that. speaking of that of all the balls that are still in the air as far as this ongoing story goes i'll be particularly interested to see where delaney lands in all this because mm -hmm. i really do think we're going to be looking to people like Sola and Priya mm -hmm. and Christina to indicate to us what the culture at BA is going to be like going forward. 
And I'm wondering what's happening behind the scenes as far as Delaney goes, whether he'll resign, whether he'll feel like he needs to make more amends in some way. And also Delaney, while certainly benefiting from his privilege and getting this very lucrative position, he, on the other hand, did not have power over anyone else's no. compensation That's or true. their positions. Absolutely. So even though he filled a position that very possibly could have been filled by someone more diverse, someone with a different voice, it'll be interesting to see how perhaps forgiving or unforgiving his coworkers may be as far as this goes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think as well as um, Solo and Priya, I think I'll also be looking at Rick, particularly because of the gay slur thing. For sure. Um, yeah, I just, if Rick's not comfortable, that's going to be difficult. And I also worry because it's going to be really difficult for us to tell unless one of them leaves. I think it's going to be hard for us to know for sure what's really going on. I hope that they won't, now that this reckoning has kind of happened, they they won't do anything they're not comfortable with in future. Um, but you know, you just never know, do you? It's really difficult. They've got to balance, you know, wanting to have a job versus feeling uncomfortable. And that's, you know, why a lot of people accept the status quo and it shouldn't be that Mm -hmm. way. But, um, Mm. I just really hope they feel able to say if they're not happy with something. Absolutely. And as we mentioned, another event that happened on Tuesday, June 9th was that Ducker, more information about Mm. his previous tweets came out something that i found very interesting just about the whole ducker story is that he kind of tried to apologize more than once and it was a little baffling to me that he would even have the audacity to try to dig himself out of this hole and i guess i was just very grateful that people weren't having it they were saying no we don't accept your apology and instead the chorus for him to resign got stronger and stronger Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think one of the most heartbreaking things as well for me on Tuesday was just Sola's statement in that BuzzFeed article where she said Absolutely. that I was made to believe by BA that nobody gave a shit about me. And I just, I was just like, oh God, Sola, nothing could be further from right? the truth. Like you were an absolute joy and everybody loved you. And I'm so angry that she was made to feel that that wasn't the case. So yeah, I just, it, it to me, like obviously what's been going on is not really about the fan community as such, um, but you know, we're like way down on the list in terms of impact. But I just, I just feel as a fan, like so betrayed by BA that they would relay that message yeah. to her like fuck you it's so <laughs> it's far from say. the truth like i have i a, know i have a friend locally who she started watching ba videos during the pandemic and then started listening to our podcast and she like will text me stuff and we've had a lot of chats and she's been saying repeatedly how much sola is her very favorite person on the whole channel and so When that came out on Tuesday, she was the first one to text me that BuzzFeed article even before I got it from you guys, like, because Mm. she was so outraged by this. It's just, uh, just so alarming. Like, Sailor's just got so much experience, so much knowledge. She, you know, that super cut that went round of her helping, I can't Mm -hmm. remember what day that was, but her helping everyone in the BA test kitchen. Mm -hmm. It was just so clear that they could barely do anything without asking her opinion (laughs) on something. Um, And it's just like, I can't, I just cannot believe that we've been duped all this time into thinking that she was being valued for that. Uh, It's just I really hope that Sola knows now or if not now, soon, just how much she does mean to the fan community. Mm -hmm. And I really, really hope that she gets compensated for that because she is invaluable to Bon Appetit. She deserves so much more. She really deserves the hashtag solidarity. If anything good came of this, that's a Mm. wonderful hashtag. And we definitely are fully behind it. And this was particularly heartbreaking knowing that she left serious eats for right. incredibly similar reasons that yeah. she was being discriminated against for being a woman of color and i know that in previous episodes we had said how glad we were 
that it seemed like Bon Appetit was a new home for her and that she was being valued, whereas <sighs> really she was just being trotted out in front of the camera to fool us, which is what happened. Yeah, I'm just so... I look back at a lot of the videos that we looked at and although we picked up on some whitewashing um, and we were critical of BA some of the time I just think so much slipped past us because they were so good at fooling everyone and Mm -hmm. I look back at some stuff now and I just think it just is all tarnished because you know what's happening like I can't rewatch videos because I just think oh shit you know it's I mean, she made an eyebrow for God's sake. Like, the woman is gold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, as the kids say, it hits different now watching older <laughs> videos. It's, I keep saying to friends and you guys, it's like the well has been poisoned. I yeah. don't know if I'll be able to go back to any of this previous content that's been released. Yeah, totally. Mm. All right, Wednesday, June 10th, we're still only midway through the week. Um, (laughs) Business Insider published an article about the toxic culture at BA. It was something they had started working on before any of this week's events. Um, It gave an in-depth look at what it was like to work at BA within the toxic environment. Many current and ex-staffers were quoted. One of the anecdotes that was shared was that Uh, staff who were people of color were emailed and banned from the test kitchen for being disruptive whilst white staff were seemingly allowed to come and go as they pleased other notable stories came from black staffer ryan walker hartshorn who was adam's assistant and she says she was treated often as the quote-unquote help even after asking hr to intervene and stop adam from texting her on weekends and asking her to do personal errands for him She also shared that when she first started, she asked him how he liked his coffee and he just stared at her and said, I don't know, like Rihanna. And we also learned from the piece that it had been Sola who confronted Adam on the Zoom call on Monday where he apologized for the Instagram post and it was Sola who called for his resignation. It was after this Zoom call that she posted her shocking Instagram story statement revealing that she was not paid for the video. And in the piece, Sola said that one hour after she posted, Matt Ducker had come to her to offer a $20,000 contract with Condé Nast Entertainment, seemingly out of thin air. Bon Appetit also on Wednesday finally released a statement on all of their social media accounts. Once again, the overriding feeling from fans on the internet was that it was too vague and it didn't go far enough. Elise Whitney A Korean-American former writer for BA expressed concern on Twitter that just because Adam had gone, it didn't mean the end of it. She called out the now-acting editor-in-chief Amanda Shapiro as a huge part of perpetuating the toxic culture, saying that she tried to cut my interview the day of the shoot because her friend Andy Baragani didn't like the person being profiled. This was the second time that Andy had used his popularity to sway editorial decisions and undercut my work. Both times he went directly to my editor to try to kill a story based on petty feelings about Anthony Porofsky. He never spoke to me about it. Both times I cried at my desk. Also on Wednesday, Amelia Ramp, another former contributing assistant food editor, shared that during her time in the BA test kitchen, she watched women of colour get kicked out of the kitchen whilst entitled white guys had full access. She says she brought it up with Carla, but she felt Carla dismissed her. She spoke of the culture of that you're either in or not. On Wednesday, The Cut announced that Jane Larkworthy, who you might remember on Monday, was someone who'd commented on Adam's uh, Instagram post when it was originally posted saying she was scared of him that night. Um, Well, The Cut decided that she needed to be suspended for her comment. Later that day, Rick posted on Instagram stories to say that Matt Ducker had called him to apologise for the hateful slurs in the tweets that had been dug up yesterday. But, Rick said that he'd had enough of apologies. They all sound the same and they are meaningless. Rick said that he asked Matt Ducker if in future his children use that language, what would he do? And apparently the first thing that Matt said he would do was say that he would be supportive like my parents have been to me. And Rick said in his stories, wrong answer. You teach them that it is wrong and hurtful and that you never use those words. Later on Wednesday, Business Insider reported that Matt Ducker is under internal investigation at Condé Nast. 
And by the end of Wednesday, Rappaport had deleted his Instagram page. That Rick story really hit me. I just mm-hmm. felt so, so, my heart went out to him. Can you imagine? That business insider story. Yeah. That was, was yeah. huge. It's pretty damning to know that Business Insider had been working on this story long before mm-hmm. the picture of Adam in brown face emerged because it was obviously known within the community and the food industry that something was rotten at Bon Appetit. And it was just sort of this perfect storm of events that finally everyone's story got to come out at the same time. And in that Business Insider article, they interviewed, I believe it was 14 staff and former staff. So it was quite a broad article from a lot of different angles, a lot Mm. of different perspectives. And you really got a good look of at what was going on. That Business Insider article was pretty astounding, pretty eye-opening. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Justine texted it to me. I was like already in bed, like going to sleep. And then she texted it to me and I read it. And I was just like, I just gasped at some of the things that Adam Rappaport said to Ryan. Like it was just- Ryan, mm-hmm. oh my goodness, yeah. Astounding, the bullshit that he pulled with her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. She had to work overtime just to make her rent. She didn't even get cost of living (sighs) wage increases. And amid the pandemic, she has been unable to work overtime because of restrictions and travel. And she reached out to Adam and said, I can't make my rent. And essentially his reaction was, well, have you considered this might not be the job for you? Which is appalling. Such such bullshit. Mm -hmm. This is the point where I completely lost all hope that we were ever coming back. Yeah, it was it was really damning. And it was so what made it most damning in a way was the fact that they've been working on this story for weeks, like mm-hmm. it was before any of this had started coming out. So it was clear that everyone knew there was a problem. It's just it just hadn't broken yet. And the fact that we've talked about this off air, the fact that the photos surfaced and all of that started lighting the touch paper was just like mm-hmm. the couldn't have gone better for Business Insider, quite frankly. You know, it just wouldn't have had the same impact if they hadn't had that to ride the back of. And we've also mentioned the Sporkful podcast a couple of times, the new episode that just came out interviewing Sola. She had a lot of interesting light to shine on stuff that happened on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. We mentioned that Ducker came to her with a offer of a $20,000 contract with Condé Nast Entertainment. And she said that this was really insulting because she had been asking for a contract for months and months. And the answer Mm. that she received repeatedly was, oh, I'm working on it. It's caught up with the lawyers. And then suddenly Uh when Sola speaks out, Ducker magically has this contract appear. And it really reeks of trying to buy her silence or her complacency. It's hush money. So yeah, hush Mm -hmm. money, essentially. So good on Sola for not taking that and for demanding that not only she get a contract with Condé Nast Entertainment, but also all the other staff members who had not been compensated for their video appearances and demanding back pay as well. This is why I get so frustrated with companies um, with this stuff, because I just, they have the money to do it because they can magically pull contracts like that out of their ass Mm -hmm. when their back's against the wall. Mm -hmm. They just don't Mm -hmm. want to. And that's just not good enough anymore. It really isn't. And I'm so glad this has all come to light because now they're being forced to. Well, it's just like, I don't know if we talk about it here, but Mackenzie Fagan's Instagram post where she says, why does it take Tammy scrolling through social media posts from a decade Mm. ago to affect change? Why must we hope someone did or said something blatantly racist or homophobic on the record to validate something we've known all along. Like, why mm-hmm. does it take this? Why does it take that? Because that's the thing. A lot shit. of these apologies <laughs> reek of people being sorry that they got caught, caught. not yeah. actually yes. being sorry for their actions. Exactly. Um, it's just the state of the world today, isn't it? It's just so <laughs> sad that you, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm annoyed that I trusted that BA was different because, you know, why would they be? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Moving on to Thursday, June 11th. Carla addressed the Business Insider piece stating that she sent a group email to a specific group of Black, white, and Asian staffers asking people to be considerate about noise. 
These were people that had been mentioned by name to her as being disruptive. However, she acknowledged that she didn't consider how it might feel for people of color to receive that email. She didn't think through that they had received the email and felt excluded, but that white staffers received the same email but felt they could ignore it, Delaney in particular. Mm -hmm. She used that as an example of the toxic culture writ large. Carla shared a screenshot of the email and stated she continued to stand with her colleagues to demand equal pay and other structural interventions. In response, Elise Whitney said that when she got that email in 2017, she first apologized to Carla, then cried in the bathroom. So did Nikita Richardson, a Black former Bon Appetit writer, who was interviewed for the Business Insider piece. When Elise asked Delaney if he got the email, he said yes, but he wasn't worried. She did worry for two years and avoided the test kitchen out of fear and anxiety. Later on Thursday, it was announced that Matt Ducker finally left Condé Nast. Jezebel published an article sharing private emails received from Adam Rappaport that week, where he quibbled over what is and isn't brownface. Not a good uh, look. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Later on Thursday, an article surfaced on Twitter that was published in 2014 on Fashion Week Daily, interviewing Emil Stanek, who was then Adam's assistant. It showed that Emil had no experience of being an assistant when he got hired, but he got to joke around with Adam and was given writing assignments. When contrasted with Ryan's recent account of needing to be contacted 24-7 and performing personal tasks, it left a sour taste in our mouth. Christina confirmed on Instagram that she has never been paid for her video appearances, causing fans to surmise that she wasn't paid for her time on Making Perfect Thanksgiving last year. Emil demanded also on Instagram that Condé Nast give more than just vague statements. He questioned when exactly pay inequities would be rectified and who will have a say in hiring new leadership. Also, how specifically is Condé Nast going to create a more diverse staff? Later, Claire made a statement on Instagram recognizing that she should have spoken out against the leadership earlier and that she didn't ask questions about Sola's or Gabby's compensations when asking them to appear in gourmet makes. She also confirmed Christina wasn't compensated for making perfect Thanksgiving. She referred to this week as a watershed for her career and her life, where she will keep learning and show up better for people she respects and earn their respect as an ally in turn. I want to say uh, around Thursday is also when things started coming out about Anna Wintour in Vogue. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which I know isn't necessarily a thing that we typically cover, but Vogue is also owned by Condé Nast. So around Mm -hmm. this time is also when it started to go like, oh, okay, this isn't just a BA problem. This is a Condé Nast. I mean, I think it was clear with Ducker that it was a Condé Nast problem, but it was showing that other brands also were having issues. Yeah. It's a Condé Nast problem. It's a food industry problem. It's yeah. a restaurant industry problem. It's a media problem. Absolutely. One of the many articles that we retweeted on our Twitter account, and be sure to check out our timeline there for a lot of sources, was a article from the San Francisco Chronicle mm. titled Bon Appetit's Race Problem is the Food Media's Race Problem. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what you were talking about, Amanda. It really shines light on how this is a systemic, large, overreaching problem that goes far beyond the Bon Appetit test kitchen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to put that into context there because I think we're going to find more. uh, I mean, you wouldn't know to look at me that I'm interested in the fashion industry, but uh, (laughs) (laughs) I just don't have money, guys. Uh, (laughs) But like reading Anna Wintour's statement, it also felt like this is not enough and I feel like they need to people should probably be asking for her resignation as well. But I guess we'll see how that unfolds in the coming weeks. I also, on Thursday, can't believe the fucking audacity of Adam to, like, quibble over what is and isn't (laughs) brown face. Like, that was the most ridiculous story that came out on Thursday. I was like, who the fuck do you think you are, mate? Like, pipe down and crawl back from where you came from. Your time is (laughs) over. You're a dinosaur. It also seems like another example of white men failing up because even right. though he's been in a publishing position for decades, he doesn't seem to understand the concept of on the record or off the yes, record. Yes, that what was a buffoon. the other thing. Yeah, that was the other thing that came out in that, that article. It was oh absolutely mind-blowing, ridiculous. And just his tone in all of those emails was like, uh, I'm like senior and know more than you. 
and it was just no I've had enough of that go away <laughs> yeah well let us never speak of Adam Rappaport again. <laughs> he does not deserve our time. No, he does not. Yeah. But we finally got Matt Ducker's resignation right. on Thursday. Yeah. I don't know about you guys, but I found the wording of um, Matt's, the announcement that he did, it was all he's left rather than yes. he's resigned or he's mm-hmm. been fired. I just thought That's that was a good an point. interesting choice of words. Mm. Yeah, I'd be interested to be a fly on that wall. Was he forced out or did he resign? It seems like maybe forced out because yeah, you know he I would take so. the opportunity to say that he had resigned if he had. I think he, uh, yeah, was forced out, which is kind of disappointing in a way that he was just clinging on, thinking that he could ride this out. Like, no, well, you're done. You're done. I mean, clearly from what he said to Rick with the yeah the whole... I mean, I know that was the the day before, but like the, oh, well, I would just be supportive of my kids. And it's like, you wouldn't take the opportunity to teach your children what's wrong. Like it's just, he, it means he doesn't, he hasn't learned, has he? No. He hasn't learned anything. No. Um, and he was clearly on like damage control for most of this week. Like he was slow to respond to everything that was coming out. He as soon as he realized that he didn't really have much of a choice, he was ringing around desperately trying to apologize to people and get them back on his side. And it was just pathetic. It really was. So I just, I couldn't be more happy that he was out, to be honest. Mm-hmm. No, as soon as they said it was a problem on the video side, I was like, it's Matt Ducker. It's Ducker. Right. Get him. Yeah. <laughs> get him. <laughs> I suspect that Ducker went to Condé Nast and said, look at what a cash cow video is look at how lucrative it is look at how it's made us relevant again yeah and i bet he tried to cling on by saying it's all me it's all thanks to me i think he totally thought he was untouchable Mm -hmm. and i'm Mm -hmm. so glad it was proven that he wasn't um absolutely one small Mm -hmm. bright spot again going back to the sporkful podcast you all should definitely listen to it sola said that this past week has actually had some of the highest highs of her life and career and she said that one of those highs was when matt ducker resigned (laughs) yeah Mm -hmm. i feel so good for the catharsis she must have felt in that moment like finally (laughs) i feel though that he's just gonna move to la and just work somewhere else (laughs) you worried that you're gonna come across him justine (laughs) yeah (laughs) i'll be looking for him (laughs) well i mean Look at the like John Lasseter was fired from Pixar and then got right. picked up at another place. Like you know, it, yeah, it happens These over people, and over. Again. They're like cockroaches. <laughs> yeah, and we know that Ducker already has contacts in LA because he was traveling here with Brad oh, and yes. the other BA crew. Because you were gonna go and stalk mm-hmm. them. I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> I was not gonna do that. <laughs> That's what LJ wanted you to do. <laughs> <laughs> I just know that they were very close to me in proximity. <laughs> anyway. So then on Friday, June 12th, at the end of a whirlwind week, Brad and Molly made statements in support of their colleagues. Molly reiterated that the boycott on appearing in videos stands until pay discrepancies are rectified. She also shared that when she signed her talent agreement with Condé Nast Entertainment for her video series, She was told by HR not to talk about the specifics of her contract with anyone else, which is how the company has been able to get away with the pay inequities for so long. By the end of the week, BA's YouTube subscriber count was hovering under 6 million subscribers. I think a big thing with this that shows the Condé Nast um, environment of what was going on and the culture that they had is the, oh, don't tell anyone how much you're making. Because right, and and I have experienced that at jobs where it's like literally it's everywhere written into the employee handbook. Don't talk to anybody about how much you make, and I feel like yeah. that's just a way to have inequities in pay between people of color and women, and to not pay people equal amounts. And it's the way they cover their asses. It's everywhere, yeah. everywhere, every company. I don't think I've worked at a company where it's open how much people are making. I think it's very rare for that to happen. And you're right, it's it's a smoke screen um, a lot of the time for bad things to happen in terms of pay inequity um, mm-hmm. for really nefarious reasons. And there's some arguments that, you know, 
being open with pay is not necessarily helpful like um because some people don't understand how pay is made up and you know some people have more experience and people may not be aware of it and all that stuff but I just think you know it's possible some companies do do it where things are open and people understand it better um and there's no confusion I I just I don't buy that it's impossible to do That's the thing. A lack of wage transparency absolutely benefits the employer. Mm -hmm. It is not in the employee's best interest to have wages obfuscated. Mm. And yeah, it's uncomfortable. And I can see why people might be reluctant to share what they make. Mm -hmm. We've seen this crop up within this conversation about Bon Appetit. People seeing how much Claire reportedly makes and being, you know, aghast Mm -hmm. (laughs) and sometimes it brings up feelings of that individual doesn't deserve that amount of money but I would say more often the feeling is why isn't my company paying me more and a lot of times the ire is rightly focused on the employer and then you have more leverage to try to get a better wage yeah Mm -hmm. I can definitely see how this happened in terms of the video point seeing the video channel grow because yeah. I've worked at two companies in the past like five or six years that when I go I worked a job there I was an assistant video editor or, or video editor when I go to work there I sign an NDA mm-hmm. and then I also sign an on-camera release I have been on camera like but not as paid as like a host or anything you know, you guys see me on camera on a show, but yeah. I'm there to do another job. Right. They get away with kind of conflating, just being like, well, you're a salaried employee, so you can kind of just do whatever we want you to do when it wasn't part of the job mm-hmm. description. Yeah, I feel like that with uh, within the industry reminds me of when the writer's strike happened, uh, you know, over 10 years ago mm. about mm. getting paid for streaming rights and that that was like a huge thing in the entertainment industry and i think this you could see as becoming another issue i mean obviously at ba but throughout the industry at large of okay how are you compensating people are you doing that just like Mm -hmm. trying to put people on camera without paying them and saying well you signed the release form so that means you can do it none of the ba people on video i don't think are represented by sag or any no. union. Mm. Union. It seems like <laughs> <laughs> it seems like Conde Nast definitely got into this circular logic, circular feedback loop of the most popular people on social should get series, but then in turn, the people who got series were therefore the most popular on social. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's just mm-hmm. this sort of like feedback loop that does not allow a foot in the door for anyone else. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, how many months have we been saying we wanted Sola to have her own series on this podcast? Oh, for ages. Yeah, I know. I find it, it might have actually happened if it had not been for quarantine. Yeah. True. Exactly. Yeah. We don't know what would have gone down if COVID didn't happen. That's true. Would any of this have come out? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Whew, okay. Um. Now moving on to Saturday, June 13th, yesterday for us. The Sporkful podcast released an excellent episode digging into the past week's events and interviewed Nikita and Sola. We learned from Sola that Ducker was a bigger problem than Adam. He got a bonus based on the performance of the videos, so it was in his interest to maintain the accessible and the mainstream nature of the channel which in reality meant maintaining its whiteness. He was also responsible for Priya only being allowed to cook Indian food, and he dismissed Sola asking him for months and months about her pay. Sola gave more detail about the day Adam resigned. She shared everyone internally was livid about the food is political essay that Adam wrote due to its wishy-washy nature and what they knew of Adam behind the scenes. She talked about the Zoom call where Adam apologized and that he was going to just move on with the meeting until she took a stand and called him out that he should resign. She also called out all the white staff that weren't saying anything and did not have their video on. 
They started being more vocal. Sola also revealed she never signed the magically produced contract Matt Ducker gave her on Monday because she is not willing to sign until everyone is fairly compensated. She is now part of a working group at BA, which includes every POC staff member that has been working long hours this week to push for change. They wrote the Bon Appetit statement that was released on Wednesday, which got softened through legal and HR. But they have kept the original draft, which, uh, which they are holding themselves accountable to, which had more teeth. The podcast episode ends with Sola saying she really feels things might actually change and it might be possible for her to not to experience casual racism anymore. Oh, Sola, I so hope that's true. Mm. Yeah. It's the only thing that's made me feel hopeful. <laughs> I know. I feel like this is perhaps a good segue into the possible path forward for Bon Appetit and the possible path forward for Pod Appetit. Because like you said, Justine, this is the one thing that's offered a little bit of hope, a little bit of light. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting to know that so many of the people of color on staff were included in drafting the sort of apology slash explanation, although of course they had nothing to apologize for. And that, as Sola said, it had a lot more oomph before it was run past legal and HR, essentially because they couldn't come right out and say, hey, by the way, BA is racist, even though that's the truth. But just knowing that they are spearheading change, we have to look to Sola and everyone else to tell us when it's okay to dip our toes back into the pool that is Bon Appetit. And also, of course, for all of the white staff to amplify voices, provide opportunity, compensate fairly and equitably. But yeah, maybe this is a path forward. And Sola mentioned in the podcast that she had just pitched another new series for Mm. her to star in. And just the thought Mm -hmm. of that actually makes me feel energized and hopeful Mm -hmm. and imagining what a Sola run series could look like in the future is something to look forward to. I yeah. think. Knowing that Ducker will not have his fingers in anything going forward also feels hopeful. Like, I know we, we've talked about throughout this episode and off mic also, but like, even watching older videos, it, they feel tainted because of that influence. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. I think going forward, knowing that that's gone and that Sola and Rick and Priya and Christina and Gabby are all like working on this, I think makes a big difference. I agree. I think that is the one thing that I feel like if if Sola and Priya and all those guys had been just more subdued, I guess, and not said as much in their own voice over the past week, I wouldn't feel confident that they necessarily felt able to speak freely. But hearing them, you know, be hugely damning in their um, on their personal social accounts and sharing details about the reality of the situation, like they are not shackled anymore, right? They are mm-hmm. speaking out. And to hear that they are on the they are at the table that is making changes for the future gives me so much confidence because they're the people that know what needs to be done because they've been the people experiencing the problems um and the fact that you know i think uh, we've heard from various people's accounts that this working group every day this week has been like on zoom calls till like 11 12 p.m at night like it's been they're working so hard and i just feel like I have faith that potentially that gives us some hope that this thing can be changed, like progress can be made with BA. It feels like people are taking it seriously and are listening to people. Um, that is that is the one thing that that I'm holding on to, I guess. Mm. Do you know who we haven't heard from? Chris? Chris, Chris. Morocco. He is the one, one person. person who hasn't said anything, has he? And he's the boss <laughs> of the kitchen. I uh-huh. think he did one Instagram story in response to Molly's call out that said he agreed, but that has been it. And there's been nothing much further in terms of detail. I don't know if he's not saying anything because he's not allowed to, or if it's that he's more culpable than we realize. Or uh, he's a 40 year old fuddy duddy old man who is like, <laughs> I don't need to like. Say on the internet. What yeah, is. that could be also. Like, I will admit, like, when Brad didn't answer for a while, 
I figured it's partially because he didn't know what to do or say. Like, Sola said, like, Brad's just now finding out yeah. racism is real in the Sporkful podcast. Yeah. That made me laugh so much. <laughs> I thought, well, yeah, he's kind of like a giant puppy. That sounds about right. But I, I do think that they shouldn't be careful to infantilize him too much. Like, he's a grown yeah, man. He is. Like, he's yeah, a children. grown ass man. This is real. I know I she's friends with it. She, I know she's friends with him and she's trying to be kind, but Sola, you deserve better. Like you deserve an ally. Like hold him to that. Yeah. With Chris though, he's the manager of that department. He's should yeah. be in charge of like Carla. People went to Carla mm-hmm. when there were problems. So mm. people had to have been coming to Chris. Yeah. Although I haven't seen any like speci- like there's been specific anecdotes shared about when people went to Carla and I haven't seen any maybe I've missed them of people going to Chris in the same way and him not doing anything um that's not to say that they haven't obviously um right I think it's interesting because Chris we know hired Sola right because they've talked about that in the videos it seemed like there have been two rounds of responses from the white chefs the first saying yes I also stand with this boycott on appearing in videos and then the second round like molly and claire and brad were varying degrees of apology for complicity in the system yeah and i would say we haven't gotten that from chris obviously we've gotten some of that in tweets from carla but i feel like perhaps she has not spoken as much as she could have also as we just mentioned she was largely the one in charge of the kitchen until Chris took over. So we know that she had some part to play in what was going on Mm -hmm. in the day-to-day workings. That's something else that's interesting about this whole event is that it's ongoing. It's not over. It's probably Mm -hmm. far from over. And there's still a lot of pieces that need to fall into place. And I just hope that it's not too long in getting justice and equity for everyone yeah. working there people looking for a nice neat wrap-up or like who's the bad guy it's not gonna happen that way it's systemic no. it's like yes there are clearly bad actors um but it's it's a whole culture and that is so difficult to unpick but i do think they're doing the right things like they've they've got rid of people that you know we know were clear people that should have been gotten rid of um they've they've put that working group together the right people are at that table you know if Sola and Priya and everyone had just cut ties I wouldn't blame them but I just they clearly want to do something for the future with BA as much as they can and make it better and I I want to support them in that you know Yeah, if this is a true watershed moment for the brand, if it's an actual changing of the guard, how exciting would it be to see a Bon Appetit YouTube channel that really puts Sola and Priya and Rick Mm. and Gabby and Christina, all of their voices front and center. And hires a black editor. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yes, for goodness sake. Something else that the Sporkful said was that apparently about six months ago, Bon Appetit had made promises to hire a black chef for the oh, test yeah. kitchen six months ago. Right. During and their diversity initiative. <laughs> yeah. So that's just frankly shameful yeah. that in half a year, they did not make good on that promise. We also um, didn't mention this in our timeline, but one of the kind of anecdotes that emerged was that Sola was sent on an assignment to um, do a piece on a black restaurant who refused to take part in it unless they had a black journalist or black writer even come and do it because they didn't trust that BA could tell a black story properly Um, and they sent Sola because they didn't have a black food writer to do the job and the the kind of thinking was well Sola's the darkest person that we've got so we'll send her and they didn't tell Sola or the restaurant writers the situation so Sola poor Sola rocks up at this restaurant these guys are like where's our black food writer and she's like uh how fucking awkward i'm just so angry that they've put her in that position it's insane it's it really makes your blood boil it's yeah. embarrassing that they didn't have anyone to go do that assignment and that should have been i mean i can't remember how long ago that was but you know isn't it for the juneteenth article out on nude stands now <laughs> <laughs> oh man possibly don't know who's buying that these days but yeah um i 
I, I, yeah, I mean, that must have been a couple of months ago. But, you know, they must, they've been looking, supposedly, they've known they have this problem and they knew they needed to fix it and they haven't appeared to have done anything meaningful to do it um, until, like, this week. And it's it's just sad that it's taken, as we've said earlier, it's sad that it's taken this, right? It's sad that we've had to find some dirt. We've had to light a touch paper. It's It's just shameful, really, that that's what it took. Absolutely. So what does this mean for pot appetite? Uh, <laughs> personally, can I be selfish and, per- and, and save for my personal of course. Go for point it. for a minute? It's just like we have fucking worked so hard on this podcast for the past year. And then now I just feel so sad and depressed and betrayed that we, you know, have made this a part of our lives this is a fucking part of like our identity you know yeah. mm. my sister told me that she keeps getting bon appetit videos recommended to her on youtube because i talk about it so much and her phone listens in <laughs> and then suggests videos to her yeah i mean i'm not like i don't think any of us are suggesting in the slightest that the impact on us is anything like the impact on the the people of color that work at bon appetit clearly we're, yeah. we're f- so far down the food chain but we've said we feel betrayed we feel hurt we feel fooled um and from you know from our perspective particularly not being not just fans but fans that were producing something because we love it so much um that we were putting mm-hmm. work into it's just like really <laughs> oh my god <laughs> yeah, yeah it's a labor of love and once that love is betrayed then it's just labor yeah. <laughs> so yeah. yeah it's been pretty heartbreaking the trust yeah. has been We're broken called a right? bon appetit fan cast like that's in our name <laughs> yeah. yeah and it's you know we can't in all consciousness like we've said on our pinned tweet we can't really call ourselves that or do anything like that whilst this is going on because you know we do care about mm-hmm. what the magazine stands for and if it's been standing for racist kind of upholding those those beliefs and those that kind of white ideal when it comes to food that's not cool and and I know we saw some of that and we were trying to we've we've always been critical like even though we love it mm-hmm. we have tried to be critical and point out and we've seen some of that but it's so much worse than even we realized Mm -hmm. um or even dreamt of like but I think the one kind of good thing when I think to the future is we do have it's not a huge platform you know we're no meme appetite but we do have a platform to hold BA to account as allies to the people of color that we love that work at BA um Mm -hmm. we've said we want to support solar and Priya and all of the other, you know, staff who are working so hard to push for change. So I think in practical terms, what this probably means for us, is, and we've spoken about this off, off air, is that we'll, we will be going on hiatus for the time being, but we are going to be watching so closely for those signals from those people as to whether it's something that we are, you know, it's safe for us to trust and support in the future because they believe it is. Like, I believe if they're comfortable, then I'm comfortable, you know? Yeah. And Mm -hmm. as Meg said, this is an ongoing story that is still developing. It's a situation that's not just going to fix itself tomorrow because we put a podcast up. Like, this is going to continue. And so we're, we're also leaving the door open that if we need to come back and talk about what's going on that we can do that right but our regular side dishes and recaps are on hiatus for sure yeah but i think as viewers and as consumers it's important to be critical even of the things we love Mm -hmm. maybe especially of the things we love yes and what we can do in the meantime is essentially vote with our clicks and our views Mm -hmm. and our exposure and our dollars absolutely so yeah, we encourage everyone to be mindful about, you know, even sending traffic Bon Appetit's way. That's maybe not something we want to support at this time. No more mm-hmm. BA and, merch for the time being. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we'll be waiting, like you said, LJ, for a signal that Bon Appetit is a welcome place again. Or or for the first time, I guess I should say. <laughs> <Yeah>. Right. <laughs> maybe on our Instagram stories, we'll go back to um, highlighting some black and yes. people of color I think that would be a really good thing to do. Mm -hmm. I think that would be great. 
so I guess, you know, we wanted to just say thank you um, towards the end of, uh, as we're wrapping up, thank you to um, firstly the other fan accounts who have really kind of, it's been, we've all supported each other this week. It's been a lot to watch our favorite thing just implode <laughs> from the inside. Um, so um, Hair Saffitz um, has said some nice things saying that we're, we were really helpful on Twitter sharing, you know, all of the information and keeping people up to date. Um, thank you so much um morocco spoons also um said similar as well as um bon appetit bot i think every bon appetit bot has been amazing in terms of keeping everyone up to date as well they've been very vocal about um you know how how unacceptable this whole thing has been um and it's just been great to have us kind of come together as a fan community and um, that's been an unexpected you know silver lining to this whole dark cloud um we've also had some lovely dms from listeners so lemons uh, test kitchen has been um you know worried about what's coming next so has danny dawson um what's next for us mary b poppin um said your podcast has helped me immensely these past few weeks it motivates me to actually get out of bed and do my dishes and shower and exercise your voices have accompanied me while i cook and i walk oh. my dogs i will miss you but this is important thank you which just about sums it up really. oh my god um, that was the best message we've ever received i, I know <laughs> so sweet so to not be doing this <laughs> it's i know and then marie said um that she just wanted to thank us for retweeting and posting all of this information i know seeing the ba test kitchen illusion come crumbling down can be hard for us fans but reading this behind the scenes content is important it's a really upsetting read but i'm glad rick sola priya ryan and others can speak up i think that you know all of those sentiments really sum it up we're super sad that we're having to be put in this position but this is important like it's really important for us to not support BA whilst this is um until change you know happens um and you know we're really gonna be supporting Sola and Priya and all the other um people of color at BA to to get that change affected we're gonna be you know doing as much as we can to hold them to account as well so we urge you guys to do the same so thank you for joining us this week we are really hopeful to be back with you soon once change is in evidence but for now i guess here's our weirdly cheery outro music from the before times (laughs) thank you all so much for listening so far we really love and appreciate you all and we hope to be back soon thank Thank you you so much thanks everyone bye Thanks for listening to Pot Appetit, a Bon Appetit fan cast. We'd love to hear from you, so find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest at pod underscore appetit. And on Facebook at Pod Appetit Podcast. You can also email us at podappetitpodcast at gmail.com and find all of our episodes on our website, podappetitpodcast.com. Until next time, the test kitchen is closed. Hi, I'm Sunny Hepburn. And I'm Brandy Fleeks. And this is Book, Book of Lies, Lies, the podcast, where we discuss liars, cheats, and thieves, scammers, and dirty, rotten scoundrels. So tune in for new episodes every Tuesday to hear about another low-down, dirty liar. And learn how to spot them. So that's Book of Lies, the podcast. Find us on your favorite podcast player or on Twitter at Book of Lies Pod, on Instagram at Book of Lies Podcast, and on Facebook at Book of Lies Podcast. And if you want to send us an email, send us one at Book of Lies Podcast at gmail.com. Okay? Bye-bye. Bye-bye.